comfort zone now. Good. I think that's perfect. Okay, so I'll go ahead and let everyone in. Give me a nod when you're ready for me to go. Ready? Okay. I would wait one minute, Jeffrey, just to okay. let everyone get in and get connected. I'm going to get another pair of glasses and see if I can do better. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. We had a little Zoom logistical hurdle this morning. Okay, I can't find any better glasses, so I'll make do. I'll <laughs> just do with these. Okay, ready to start? Yeah. Okay, hello. Welcome to Celebrate the Arts, brought to you by the Florida Artist Group, also known as FLAG. FLAG is proudly celebrating our 72nd annual exhibition and symposium. My name is Jeffrey Smart Basden, and it is my great pleasure to introduce session number 15, The Art of Being an Artist with Laurie Snow Hind. This presentation is being recorded for later publication and public access. And so we request that you remain muted throughout. Your questions are encouraged, but we ask that you hold them until the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. As a courtesy, please keep your questions succinct and on topic. Now, please welcome Lori Snow Hine. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be able to be here with you and to share some things about my experiences over the past 30 years of my being a professional artist. I am going to just take you through a slide presentation so that it can be shown effectively later and you can take more time reading it or going through it. There's a video in the very first part of the presentation. I'm going to skip that video. If we have time after questions, I'll put it on at the end. It just gives you a little bit of my history and background. And I don't want to take that three to five minutes up for you now, because if I do, I might run short of answering questions and I want to do that. So welcome everybody. And I'm going to go right to the presentation so we can get as much in as possible. Share. Okay, this is my presentation and I'm going to break it up. I'll put it up play. I think is what I want. Okay. Okay, everybody can see this okay, I think. And um, this is one of my most recent paintings. Underneath is the link. So if you want to watch this separately afterwards before you get the video, you can just copy that link down and you can you can see the little video that was done. And first, that's the video. Hey, I'm Lori Hine. Oh, I was going to skip that one. Let's see if I can skip that. There. Okay. So if you're going to be an artist and you want to make a living at it, as I have, you've got to set some goals for yourself. One of the very first things that helped me was that I actually decided to break down how much did I make, make did I need to make in a year? And I knew there's 52 weeks in a year. I was going to take two weeks off. So I divided by 50, my income, and I wanted to make 50,000 a year. That means I needed to make $1,000 a week, or a month rather. No, a week, $1,000 a week. And I knew I was going to work a five-day week. So I had to make $200 for that particular day. Uh, when I work. So that helped me set prices for my paintings and for my teaching. You also need to decide what your income stream is going to be. For me, when it first started out, it was just painting portraits. But as I went along, I picked up other ways of making money. So I do commissions and uh, I, I, made, I ended up making prints and do licensing. I've done teaching. I still teach. I've been teaching for 32 years here in Palm Beach at several large clubs. I do art shows and art shows turned out to be the best way for me to be able to sell my original paintings and actually sell my 
uh, prints that I got as a royalty from my uh, licensing company. Uh, you have to know your why to be successful. It has to be a driving force to be able to say, I don't feel like doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I did a lot of that. I didn't always feel like setting up my tent in the rain, but I did it anyway. And, um, and then when you know your why, and then my why was six kids that needed to be fed, a husband that wasn't working, bills that needed to be paid, and there's no other way to get it done. And my only talent was art. So in setting your goals, you need to, as I said, break it down. I, this is, I'm not going to go over every bit of it, how I did it, but you can read that later. I do, I do price my work by the square inch. That gives me the opportunity to be able to work with decorators and galleries, and they know without having to contact me and ask me, how much is that painting going to be? They know they can pretty well give a price range for that painting and tell the client that this is the price range between that point and that and this point and that. So my paintings range between four and $8 a square inch, depending on the detail and also depending on the size, because sometimes a smaller painting be at a larger amount per square inch than a really large painting. I When I'm working at a um, show, I'm always thinking of what room my client is gonna put a painting in. If you really think about it, the living room is gonna be where they're gonna be willing to spend the most amount of money. So if you paint large paintings to go in a living room, you're gonna be able to sell larger paintings at a better price. The next most important room would be the dining room in the house. And then we've got the foyer and the master bedroom, the kitchen and uh, the hallway and the bathroom. And each one has a different level that people are willing to pay. So uh, when you're painting and you're gonna display for a show, it's gonna help you to know who's gonna buy your painting, who are you painting for? Uh, as far as what kind of clientele and where they're going to use the painting in the house. Um, I also have, I like to plan for passive income. Passive income is, is really meaningful as you get older as an artist because you can't be running around doing the shows and, 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 and it's hard when bad times come to sometimes get work to be sold at a gallery. So I found that with licensing my work, I created passive income early on in my career. And it's even worked out better as my career has gone on because now I license through fine art, not license, but I sell my art through Fine Art America. And I've got a steady stream of income coming in every month from that, as well as royalties from books that I've done in the past and still working with the licensing company and royalties there. So think of different ways when you paint a picture, can that painting be used? It's like not if I paint just a portrait, that portrait can only be a one-time shot. I might have to wait 20 years for that child to have a child to paint another portrait. But if I paint a picture of an ocean like I've got behind me, I can then license that ocean and I can sell it many different times in many different ways. And that's been very beneficial and helpful to me. Uh, when, when you're setting your goals, realize that it may take some time to reach a goal, but it's always important to do that. My first goal was 50,000. It took me about five years to get to that point. And then my next goal, I set it for 75,000. And it took me another two years to get to that point. And then my goal was 100,000. And I got to that point within another year. So it, it, it kind of accelerates as you go along because you learn so much. So setting those goals and, and, and having a insight. Now that 100,000 wasn't just selling paintings. It was teaching and it was bringing in licensing. Back in the 90s, I was making as much as $40,000, $50,000 a year just in licensing. And that is where a company would pay me to paint a picture. I'd paint the picture. They would sell the images of that picture and I would reap the royalties and still own the painting. It's much nicer than working for a big company that then owns the painting and you don't have a chance to use it again. I like being able to, to uh, use my work to its greatest advantage. Uh, I, I try to make people to realize how important it is to really believe in yourself. For me to believe in myself, when we've gone eight months without any income coming in from my family, and then to go out and take a loan for $5,000 to run an ad in Veranda Magazine to get a portrait commissions was a, a hard decision to make, but at the same time, I had to believe in myself that I could do it. And my first ad in Veranda Magazine, I didn't sell, I didn't get a single sale. And that was a $5,000 ad. And the, and the agent came back on and said, hey, we've got, uh, you've got to run another ad. And I said, I can't afford it. She said, you can't afford not to. So I ran a second ad and I got some different artists, I think, I'm not sure, actually inquiring about my work. And I didn't get any sales yet. And then she said, well, you need to run another ad. You can't, you can't just run two ads and it won't work. You gotta run three ads. I ran the third ad and I had a person from Louisiana call me. And for the past 20 some years, I have had portraits from Louisiana. They didn't even ask me how much my work was. They just said, we want you to come pay our children. 
And that has just gone into other portrait commissions year after year. So when you, if you're gonna choose to advertise, you need to be very consistent in your advertising. It needs to be where people see you enough that they know that you're there and that you're serious about your work and you're gonna keep doing it and that you're gonna be there for them when they wanna come back to you. That's true whether you're going to art shows or you're showing in a gallery. Consistency is so important that they need to see you not just one time, but two or three times. Um, and just remember, there's nobody else just like you. That you don't try to copy or chase somebody else's style or their work. God made you just to do what you do, the way you do it. And whether it's an abstract or whether it's a contemporary painting or whether it's a sculpture or a collage, that is what you were meant to do. So do it at your very best. When you want to, when you display your art, it's super important that you display it at its, at its very best advantage. You've got to make that work look important and valuable. I get a little careless sometimes. I don't treat my work as to look as valuable as I should. But like you know, it's not even a bad idea if you're holding the painting directly to put a pair of gloves on and show that you show respect for your own work or, or wrap it good when you give it to the client so that they know that, that you really know that work is valuable. So you also wanna create a, a very cohesive collection of your work with sizes, colors, and designs that look good together when you show them in a gallery or at an art fair. Any place you show your work, you wanna make sure you're putting that best foot forward. Uh, it's one of the big mistakes that people make is when they're showing their work in an art show or even a gallery, they have too many different style, styles of frames, too many different sizes. And sometimes the frame takes away. I really got to where I love a gallery wrap and let the artist let, let, let the art show for itself. And then the client help them frame it or um, have them choose a frame of the choice. So I keep the gallery wrap. When you're showing your art, whether it's in your own home or whether it's in a gallery or whether you're at an art show, you want to make sure that each wall, each space is well designed, not just the paintings. It's, it's like less is more than if you have too much. You want the wall to look good. I've got some examples I'm going to show you. Um, when you do your website, make a really nice website. Make it look good to your client. Don't try to just cram any work on it. Put only your best work on it. Always put your best work forward and show yourself to the best. It's best to do things in collections. These top four paintings are such that somebody would buy all four and arrange them in a, in a square pattern or a horizontal or a vertical pattern in their kitchen or their dining room. So it gives me a chance to sell more than one painting at a time. Also, these were tiny paintings. They were just uh, 12 inch squares but they could be blown up to 24 inch, 30 inch squares, and they would become a large clay in somebody's room. That was very important sales with one painting. You could also drop a painting on either side, like these the apples and the pears with maybe a flower in the middle. So I gave clients a way to see them, see my art different ways and, and, and keep things in collections. This is my uh, Fine Art America website. It shows you all the different collections I have. Uh, with with Fine Art America, no, did I miss a page? No, okay. With Fine Art America, you want to be sure that you do things in collections. If you look underneath the name of each category, like it says beaches, then you see under that, I think it says 41 images. So that if I go into that category, it shows 41 images. These are all going to be images that I've actually sold. They're not any longer available because I use FASO, Fine Art Studio Online, to show my original work and my very best work. I keep it separate. But this Fine Art America has been so successful for me. Uh, I This month, I got a check for $1,500. My, my royalties from them go anywhere from $500 a month up to $4,000 a month and over $40,000 a year as a, as a rule. So I say, you know, make, keep in mind other ways to make money if it's important to you, because I was supporting a family. Not all of you have to do that. More, you, some of you don't have to worry about it at all. But for me, it was a, it was a necessity. This is how I, as an artist, was able to um, do it. Now, when you're adding the Fine Art America, only add one or two images in each category at a time. Only one image a day after you get the initial website set up. I put maybe four images in of each category, and then one a day or one a week or one a month. If you add consistently it, and over time, don't put everything up at once. That's when you get in the algorithm where you're going to come up, people are going to see your work, and you're going to start selling. If you put everything up at once, you're going to just die out. I still have paintings to put up that have never been put on Fine Art America, uh, probably another 50 or more that I will be putting up over time. People say, I don't have time to do that. 
I hired somebody, another artist actually that wanted to be mentored. And I, and I said, instead of you paying me to mentor you, I will pay you to help me because she was good at graphic art. I also advertised before this with um, uh, on the internet on Craigslist and I found somebody that was good with graphic art because I didn't want to divide my time up learning how to do all the graphic art and all the computer stuff. I'm best at my painting. Uh, when you join these groups, uh, when, when you join Fine Art America or FASCO, there's groups within those groups. And if you participate, you'll also get more recognition from, from potential clients. So think about that too. Uh, this is the Garden and Gates collection, just to give you an idea. When you can do two paintings that go together, like the two on the side that are vertical, those two paintings look nice on either side of, of a bookcase. And there was actually a third painting that was the center piece of this painting. So I do things in collections. It really helps to create themes in everything that you do. This is another collection I did of roosters. Now, this was for Walmart and for Cracker Barrel, they wanted a, a they wanted roosters. So I painted this one rooster that has the wrought iron work he without the wrought iron. And then I put the wrought iron work in on, an, on another painting of him. You can see where on the bottom left, I've got two, the same rooster twice, but different backgrounds. Again, it goes into licensing and to be able to use that animal or that, that, that uh, in this case, rooster a different way. So think about how a client might use it in their kitchen or their house or their colors. And if you've, you've got a graphic artist working for you, you can even have that graphic artist take this white rooster here and put a yellow background on it or put a purple background, whatever color you want, because it's easy to change. So think of different ways you can use your art to create your income. This is my collection of Amish children. When I first started painting, I, I was a portrait artist. I love painting children. I painted my children. These are children that I know that are in the painting that have faces. Uh, but I also wanted to create something that was timeless. So if I painted my children with their clothes, then it would have been dated. And I had come from Amish country when I, I went to college. I was in Columbus, Ohio, Art School of Art and Design, and there's Amish in the area and over in Pennsylvania where a girlfriend lived. So I kind of fell in love with the colors and the styles of the Amish. And, and I actually did things that I remember from my childhood when I painted these. The one of the little girl with the uh, goat sleeping in the hay, that was my daughter. I milked goats. I had, I had a big farm. And uh, my daughter, I, if I put her in her regular clothes, it wouldn't have the same impact as it told the story. This, these paintings all got picked up and put in greeting cards. They got put in a book. So it gave me more recognition and a wider way to sell my paintings. And they actually actually put into figurines. So they actually made figurines out of all, all these and sold in the gift market. When you're trying to decide what to paint, what is your reason to paint? We went through that some, so I won't read everything in here. But remember that large paintings do sell to a higher income person for more money. And if you have a big house with big art, you're going to have bigger bucks. And that was something I learned early on. Another artist told me that because I had a bunch of little paintings. And uh, you do need to know your client. You need to know who you're painting for. You need to know what style do they like. You need to be aware of the, what's going on in the furniture market market, what's going on in the gift market. You gotta decide what area you want to sell to to be able to really market your art well and to be able to sell it well. Um, I always keep good digital images of all my work, even work I don't like because uh, paintings that you may not like, somebody else will love. It's, it's hard to imagine sometimes that somebody likes a painting that you don't like, but one of my best selling paintings was a picture of uh, kittens in a basket that were drop, the baby kittens were dropped off in front of my house. I picked them up, fed them my goat's milk and, and let them grow up. And I took pictures of them, painted them. It wasn't a very good painting, but it was one of my best licensing design paintings. So who would guess? So do take digital images, um, create a brand for yourself. If you create, you can't be all over the place. In the beginning, I was all over the place. I painted anything, any way anybody wanted it because I wanted the work. But now, and, and about 2005, I decided I love Florida. I really want to be a Florida artist. I want to be known as a Florida artist. Florida Artist Group was a great group for me to join because I love Florida. And um, I started painting Florida more. I painted everything in Florida, the botanicals, the oceans, the skies. Uh, the inland, the outland, you know, the beaches, everything. Um, you need to think about uh, what do you want to convey in your art. For me, uh, I, I like to create a feeling in my art that people uh, feel how I feel about that particular thing. You need to know your strengths and your weaknesses, uh, what you love, and you do want to follow your passion. And that brought me to painting. Florida mostly. Here's a collection of a blue color trend theme. So if you're looking through a, a home design magazine or you're looking on, uh, if you're walking through a furniture store, you'll see that there's different color trends. Right now, the, in the past year, the color trends have been gray and blues 
And these pick up the aquas that are so popular and they still are something that I love to paint. They're, they're the birds that I love that, and the oceans that I love. So color theme is very important to your success in selling your painting. If, if right now I was painting all red, like I did 10 years ago, which was very popular, reds and yellows and warm, but this past several years has been cooler colors. There's my cooler warm, there's my, some of my warmer tones when I was doing my, more of my botanicals in Florida. It's really nice to look at the painting and say, okay, what will go with this painting? So if they buy this painting on the top right that has a little bit of, of, of a sea grape in it and it's got an ocean, that's gonna go in their living room. But for their dining room, they'll take one of these paintings on the left and, and put it in their dining room. And for the hallway, they'll make, take this big tall painting of the palm tree, uh, of the uh, bird of paradise palms and put it uh, in their hallway uh, over their bathtub or, or in the bathroom even. And I often will go in a person's house and be able to sell three to five paintings to the person that was only gonna buy one painting because I made an appointment to go to the house instead of just giving them the art at the art show and telling them here, take this home. I said, let me deliver it for you. When you go to deliver the painting, they will show you other rooms in their house that they would like art for. And you might be able to fulfill that need to sell them art. So that just gives you another idea. So this is a little bit about licensing art. There's so much to go into. Each of these categories, I could spend an hour on and tell you more, but this kind of gives you an idea of licensing your art. On the top right is a little gal that makes millions of dollars just doing puppy dogs and rabbits and kitty cats and cute little ways, just licensing her art. She gets to keep all the images, but there's, there's our art, very popular. Down in the bottom, Jewel Licensing is the company that licensed me now. And uh, my check this past year was probably about, about 40,000 with them. So that was a good chunk of income for something that I've already done. It's out there, it's been done. And it doesn't matter, you don't have to do like I paint. It, you could be total abstract. You look on my Fine Art America site, I have a, a little bit of uh, abstract art about creation and it's, there's no actual image in it, but I've sold shower curtains and pillows and things from that particular design. And it's made a, an impact on my, you know, on my income. So, so do your research, read some books. I have read so many books. There's some great uh, uh, websites out there and, and companies on the web that will help you actually do more uh, with learning how to do it. Artsy Shark is a good one, Abundant Artist. The best, in my opinion, is Faso. Faso, when you join that website, it's $25 a month. Uh, you get to, sh to show two pictures in their art contest. The exposure you will get is absolutely amazing and the teaching you'll get is endless. So I, re I, I recommend that. You need to, again, visit the stores. Like Cracker Barrel was one of my favorite stops for licensing because I would see what they're selling and I would then uh, go and say, okay, this is what's popular right now. And I plan ahead to see how I could make something that would fit into that particular, that particular product that would look good. You can do a mock-up of your uh, images by going on uh, Faso to do a quick mock-up. But if you have a, a, a designer or a graphic person to do a mock-up of your things, that's even better. My next slide will show that. There's a mock-up. So that there's my roosters that you saw earlier. I've mocked them up on platters and plates and shown a dinner collection. Down below is a fabric collection. I wish I'd taken a picture of the uh, quilt I made from all the fabrics made from my cowboy collection. It makes a great cowboy quilt that I've got on my bed with my horses running across it. Uh, your little sketches work too. They never know when somebody might want a sketch. On the far right is on the bottom there are some of my angel paintings. I did a collection of angels for calendars. And these angels were put on cups. They're used for uh, Christian organizations, all kinds of ways, greeting cards. You can see the, the, the babies' pictures on the crosses up above. That was from my book, uh, I Love uh, Mommy Don't Cry, There's No Tears in Heaven. And all those images were used in different ways. And on the very top with the horses running across the page, that looks, that's what the front of my portfolio looked like that I took to the licensing shows or that I took to, I have like, six different books, each with a different category that I take to the licensing show and also to the market uh, at Atlanta Mart. And you don't have to, uh, you just, you go in the Atlanta Mart and take your books, make an appointment and go around and see different uh, people that make products that you think your work would look good on. And they will, they're interested in talking to you, but you need to make appointments. Um, art festivals. My, my greatest amount of income probably has come from art festivals. That's where I sell my originals. If I had through the uh, down periods in this past economy, if I uh, relied, relied on a gallery to sell my work to make a living, 
would have been in bad, bad shape. But the art festivals continue to be good for me, even with the down economy. So uh, here's some sales tips for art festivals. Again, I talked about it. Use a theme for your exhibit. Treat your walls as you hang your work on a cam as a work of canvas. So each wall, they have three walls on, on the inside of your tent, has to actually have a, have a, a abstract design ability to it that looks good. You need to have a hook painting that your largest, biggest, probably most expensive painting that's going to make people stop and look or it's going to shock them. I don't care you know, what kind of style you do, but you want that hook painting that you think is your best, largest, most uh, noticeable piece. And you want to either hang it depending on which way the traffic is going on the side that the traffic is headed whether they're heading straight at you to the left or the right, you put that biggest hook that makes them stop, that looks, it makes them look at your art. So you consider that flow of the traffic and smaller uh, paintings of work group and a design that will look good to sell together. Instead of selling just one painting, why not sell two or three? Uh, I type different price ranges. I look for different price ranges for different clients. When you sell to the masses, you might get more people. When you sell to the classes, you might only sell one painting, but it will sell for 10 times as much. So I try to have something that'll meet every client's need. I, again, I think about which rooms they go in. I make people walk into my booth to get my card to look at my flyer. I do keep a price list that's printed, not on the wall. I want people to ask me about my art so I can talk to them, so I can engage. When you engage with a person, you can make a sale much easier than if they just walk up and look at a, a, a price on a, on, a, on a painting and they don't understand why it's priced at that particular price. So I do evaluate my client. I try to ask them, what are they looking for? What room are they looking for to put a painting in? So I can engage them in a conversation. Uh, I, I'll even ask them when they ask me a price, they say, are you looking for an original or are your clays okay for you? They say, I only buy originals. Then I don't talk about originals. But if they say, oh, I don't care. I just want a nice painting for my condo. I know what, what to talk to them about. So you want to find out about your client as much as you can and get them in a conversation. So I try to often, often answer a question with their question and then give them their answer too. So and I also try to determine who's the decision maker. Is the woman the decision maker? Is the man? Because you want to make good eye contact you can't make eye contact with both. You can look back and forth, but eye contact's important. This weekend at the art festival, Art and Girl, I was helping some emerging artists. And this is one emerging artist that I walked by and her work was beautiful. She'd never done any shows before. She hasn't really been selling or making a lot of money with her art. And I looked at her work and I said, oh my goodness, you need to rearrange these. Yeah, you need to take some down and you've got too many and all the frames close together, the black shapes in between don't work. I asked her to send me a photograph of my finished uh, situation because I had to get back to my tent. I took quite a bit of time with her about 30 minutes or more helping her rearrange her paintings. I didn't get that photograph, so I can't show it to you, but I, I took this big pelican, moved it to the right. He was a good hook. I took, I made the, uh, turtle in the background there, much more important on the head. I took the bird, moved them up, took the top two paintings off. I just rearranged it. It looked wonderful afterwards. And I, I bet she made some sales because she's a good artist. Now, the other artist that I helped, because I tried to help too, this is her paintings. And I walked by and said, you've got some really beautiful creative stuff here. Would you like some help? I wish I could have shown you this wall before she I, I rearranged it for her because everything was colored. She had about 10, 20 more paintings up. Nothing was grouped. You can see how I grouped the paintings on the right together, the two large ones. I moved into my blue tones, into my red tones, into the brown tones, and picked up some green paintings. I, I clustered her smaller paintings together. On the table, she had all these plaques on, on easels. She had her name all over the place with her uh, barcode that you could scan. I said, take all that down. Your work has to look beautiful. So I helped her set up and uh, hope she's on the Zoom. So show, I would love to have seen, had, had a, a picture of her work before we rearranged it. It's pretty impressive how you arrange your work makes a huge difference. This is my slide for Artie Girl this weekend. You can see that on the bottom right, that was my traffic flow, the large painting. It would be nice to put it on the top too, but it wouldn't work. The top painting had to have a heavier hanger bar. But I caught my two biggest paintings that I thought were some of my best that people would be looking for. I did sell the top painting on, on this particular slide. I have the my um, little booth stand where I have my book on the top of that stand with a uh, uh, 
uh, Heron is. There's a book that shows all my artwork so people can look and see other things. I, I did sell that particular Heron. On the back wall, I've got two ocean paintings. Again, two big hooks. I, I got went for two hooks with this painting. People coming straight across the field, people walking the direction. And then I clustered out another group of paintings on the right, uh, on the left there. So it just gives you an idea of how I set up my booth for this particular show. Okay, this is uh, Know Your Trends and Colors, a little bit of repetition, but what is popular, and what is sold in, in, in what part of the country. I like to create a feeling in my painting and emotion. Emotions are what sell paintings. Uh, if you create a feeling or a mood that people relate to, people are going to buy that mood. And it doesn't matter what style you paint, it's still that uh, feeling that they get from it. Um, galleries create, are very important uh, at some point in your career because they create a presence and awareness of your work. Uh, people will look on your website. They want to know what galleries you've been in, what you know, how you know how are you known. So uh, professional galleries give you the status that you want, a stamp of approval that your client wants. A business gallery can be effective because they, if they are the right uh, project for that particular thing, that's something that some, some real estate offices that I thought was really nice over in the Naples area. Co-op galleries. Uh, I did start with a co-op gallery when I was first a portrait artist and it helped me got, get started. And uh, you know, I sold a couple of paintings that way. But it's not wasn't a, a big thing for me, but you benefit by other good artists. You don't want to so associate yourself with artists that you think are not going to also attract clients if you're in a co-op that are going to attract clients that, that would not be your client. So do know your client. The Home Studio Gallery has been one of my most effective galleries. I've sold on an average of twenty to thousand dollars each Home Studio Gallery, and sometimes more. People that see your work at other places. Uh, the the uh, art shows, for instance, are in a coffee shop or wherever you might have had your work. I don't do any of that, the coffee shops and that sort of thing anymore. But when they see your work and you can get their email and you can send out a notice or a personal letter to a professional card to them and say, please come to my home gallery. I even have uh, at my home gallery show, I make uh, appointments to see somebody one on one. I usually do them for a weekend to a weekend and they work out extremely well. Remember, your Internet site is also your gallery, so set it up like a gallery. Everybody's gonna check out your, your website. It's very important, your presence online. I've done pop-up galleries, a lot of fun, next to a very expensive restaurant where people of, uh, of ability to buy paintings are able to go to and be able to afford your art. Uh, that works great. My two favorite companies that have worked well for me, there's so many out there. There's over a hundred different website companies, probably over a hundred different print-on-demand companies. Um, also, I can't recommend it highly enough. I wish I could make money referring people to them. I don't. I just do it refer people because I want other artists to be successful. And the artists that are in that particular on that site are fantastic artists. They internet, they, they, they network together. They have a, a, a monthly contest for their artwork. It's viewed by uh, probably 100,000 people. I've sold, I've sold originals. There's no commission you pay for that original. Um, so it, it's just, a, they give you so many tools to how to do everything. You don't have to join workshops to learn. They can help you do it. Uh, Fine Art America. Oh, I actually joined Fine Art America because I was angry. I had, had a licensed agent steal, so I licensed my work to a uh, printer over in the West Coast area. He stole all my images. He never paid me for them. I spent 10 years trying to stop him. And then I finally said, I'm just going to go in competition with him. So I went on Fine Art America because I didn't trust any website. And I thought, well, what matters? These are all stolen already. And I put them on dirt cheap. And I thought I'll sell against them. And, and I'm just underrated, him, but I didn't sell. I didn't sell on Fine Art America at that time. It wasn't until about four years later, I was invited to uh, the um, Word of Fowl Festival up in Maryland. And I realized I needed to get everything consistent on the web, wherever my name showed up. And I went back on Fine Art America, raised all my prices four times what they were and reposted them. I hired somebody from Craigslist to do that for me. I had them come to my house. I directed them. So it wasn't just, you know, I didn't do it over, over the internet. I made them come to my house and paid them that way. And all of a sudden, my first sale the next month after starting to repost was $3,000. It blew my socks off because I didn't know I could even sell that much on Fine Art America. And uh, it's, again, knowing how to use the meta tags, using the algorithms, I could do a whole talk just on Fine Art America and websites and, and box, print on demand. But this site is honest, they're good about paying, they do good work, I've never had anybody complain. 
You only need a 25 megapixel image. It needs to be good and clear, but most people have a camera that will do that. So um, that's a good choice. This, is a, this shows you a page on my Fine Art America. It shows, you, it shows the large image. It shows you all the different possibilities they'll print for you. It shows, I, I put some of the different items that I can, you can make out of it. The handbag is the shark. That was my first big sale on Fine Art America. Uh, that I sold that print for $3,000. It was a great big print that they were able to make and sell. So I was delighted. And then I, my, my botanical was a pillow. And on the very bottom is the shower curtain. That is my abstract art that I was telling you about. So I have different categories that I work from. This is the page on FASO that shows you actually your algorithms as far as what's, what the traffic for the day is. You can see in the very middle, the graph that goes up and down. The day that goes way up at the end, that's when I did the Bonita Springs Art Show. So if you refer people from your art show and look at your postcard, FASTA's on that, uh, Fine Art America's on that, you can see that your, your, your sales are gonna go up, your traffic's gonna go up. It just really makes a difference. If you're gonna have a print on demand company, you can't rely on the company and the internet to do it all. You need to do it yourself too. I've just shown some of the different people, uh, Daniel Gerhardt, uh, Michelle Dunaway. These are phenomenal artists that have their work on this site. They know what they're doing, so you'd be wise to follow them. Uh, I wish you much success in all that you do with your art and you create your life as an artist and, and enrich other people's lives because your art brings joy to a home. It, it changes a home dramatically. When you walk in a home and you see a beautiful piece of art, it's the centerpiece of the whole house. Uh, they might spend $5,000, $10,000 on a couch, but it's the art that makes the room. So uh, realize your power as an artist, what you can actually create for somebody else and how beautiful you can make your life and their life. Uh, make sure you do what you love, love what you do, and uh, I'm ready to answer some questions. I hope I've got time to get through them all with you. Any questions? I have one question that was posted on the chat. It says, how do you control the quality of your products you sell through Fine Art America? I posted some greeting cards and placed an order and was very disappointed with the colors. You probably did not give them a good enough print or proof, and they are very good about changing things if you need to. You can talk to their, uh, 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 you can talk to their, what do they call it, the people that work there, and they will make changes for you. So, uh, and sometimes the color mistakes are better. I don't care if they take my image like the rooster and I put a blue background or a green background or a yellow background. I want to be selling that particular art. It's very different if I have a painting like I've got beside, behind me of my ocean that I'm working on, this is not done. That, that, that particular painting, I'm gonna sell as, as a fine art piece. I understand that some of my art is not fine art. It's, it's, a, it's a quality art, okay, but it's made for a different purpose. So a greeting card to me, I would never sell at an art festival. I see people all the time taking greeting cards and taking uh, little tiny knickknacks with them to the show. Uh, that's one gal that was an emerging artist. She had these trays that she was taking to the show. Either you're gonna sell trays and cards or you're gonna sell art and you don't wanna mix it up at the show. You can, you can do it elsewhere. But if I sell my greeting cards at a show for $5 or $10 a pack, I'm not selling my paintings. And those people that come in to buy that item is not going to want to necessarily, I, I'm taking somebody else's time I could be selling to an original painting. Hey, Laurie, Laurie, Laurie mm -hmm. uh, this is Nancy. Could you stop sharing your screen so that others can hear? Yeah. Let's see, so, so they can see me talking. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, okay. much better. Thank you. Okay, so I, I need to get out of there too. I, I, all I, can, I can't see anybody now because I just have that. Let's see. Where Let's see. Okay, so another just, question. How's that? Hi. <laughs> another question that was asked, but I think you have answered it, but they may, you may want to restate it, was the mm -hmm. question about um, the cost of Fine Art America and the, the FASO. What was the they're the best deal out there. Price. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you asked because uh, a Fine Art America is $30 a year and you get a complete website and you can set it up in categories. You can get tremendous exposure. I have sold original paintings, large original paintings off of Fine Art America because they don't even charge anything for it. You just make the contact yourself. I've had people Google, uh, one gentleman Googled ospreys and I happen to have some ospreys on my Fine Art America. He saw them. 
he contacted me through the email. I thought he was one of these spam people that try to rip you off because he's about the email. I'm looking for a big painting for my house. I want this kind of art. What do you have? And I wrote him back. I said, look on my website. I've got this painting. I've got these paintings. He went to my FASO site. So I redirected him to my FASO site. He looked at it and emailed me back. He said, consider it sold. And I thought, yeah, right. This is one of these scammers. It's not going to be sold. I, I went ahead and told him my highest price on my list, my $8 a square inch. I put it up at $16,000. He called me up on the phone and said, when can you deliver it? And I said, how do you want it delivered? He said, I'll pay you to drive it down to Marathon. Uh, I'll put you up for the night. And I'd like you to come out on my boat. I want you to take pictures of frigates and we're going to paint frigates next. I ended up doing $80,000 with them. Okay, Whoa. so that just gives you an, an example of unexpected things. I thought he was going to be a crook. <laughs> so you have to treat everybody with respect, even when they we think they're spamming you. But you just you just watch your watch yourself that you don't get yourself in trouble. Did I answer that? Okay. I have a question. <laughs> so that was fine. Our maker Faso is. Um, I think I pay twenty five dollars a month for Faso. That gives me two uh, entries into their art uh, uh, contest. And their art contests are fabulous because they're internationally watched. People come from all over to see other artists that are better than you, better than me. And they want to see what the new work is and what's on that site. And you sell there too, as well as bring people to my FASO site. And then from FASO site, I could drag that when they click, click on a different collection that they want to look at lithos, it takes them right to my Fine Art America site. It's all connected. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to pack a painting. I don't have to do anything. Everything is done for me. It's beautiful. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Okay. You are an amazing businesswoman, and this is obvious from your presentation. How do you uh, discipline yourself to have time to actually create the art? I hire people too. Remember, I told you in the very beginning that I went on uh, Craigslist. Uh -huh. I ran an ad. It was. It was. I totally looked at everything I wanted to be able to do because I wanted to know if I was going to buy my own clay printer. It was one of those $6,000 machines. I did not want to run it. So I ran an ad. I had probably a whole page of qualifications they needed to do. It's amazing how graphic artists, many of many artists cannot market themselves, even if they're graphic artists and they work for pennies and they work for somebody else. And I told them my starting pay was $10 an hour. My pay is $150 an hour when I teach. So I can afford $10 an hour. And um, I, I went ahead and advertised. I had 30 responses in two days. So then I, I, I sent out a, a, a letter for them to answer different questions that I had about them, interviewed three or four and chose one. I got a very talented young man, about 21 years old, that had just come out of Ringling School of Art. He was happy to work for $10 an hour. And he ran my printer, he did my graphic work, he did everything. So if you're willing to take the time to look, you'll find people, you don't have to do it. And right now I've got a wonderful gal, Heather, who uh, works for me. And she came to me and she said, will you mentor me? And I said, I don't only mentor you, I'll hire you, <laughs> you know? And so I hire her. I pay her a, a flat rate when she comes to my house. I pay her another rate when she works from home. I give her her own hours from home. I have learned to trust her. She works. She does all my newsletters. I can't do all this. I read, I think it's Lori Putnam wrote a book, I'd Rather Be Painting. And it was all, all what you do to earn money as an artist and all the Instagram and Facebook and all the social media. I said, I can't do that. I, it wore me out reading the book. And I, 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 you know, I'm not up to it. And that's when I realized uh, I needed to hire somebody to do things for me. And it's well worth it. Heather has, has been such a blessing to me uh, when I have some great sales on Fine Art America. I'll send her an extra check. I'll give her bonuses as often as I can. Because, uh, and if I, if I, you know, I, I want her to succeed too. That, did I answer that okay? That was great, thank you. But don't do it yourself. Now, the way I learned to be a good marketing person, believe it or not, I totally give to Amway. I, when my husband lost his job when I was 40 years old, had a brand new baby, number six. Uh, eight months into that, we weren't working. He wasn't working yet. And I thought, ah, Amway came my way and I thought, He'll do this. We'll get him in Amway. So I got him in Amway and I did what we could to build it. And we stayed in Amway for about five years. He didn't really build it. I built it to about 300 people in the network. But that, what Amway made me do was read a book every week. And I had to read the books that they wanted me to read. Skill with people, uh, Think and Grow Rich, uh, How to Influence Friends and, 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 and just 
dozens and dozens and dozens of books and that changes who you are. I grew up when I was 40 years old. I had, I was no longer a little housewife painting what I wanted to do, doing portraits from my friends, trading for dresses for my girls. I had to grow up and Amway taught me to grow up. And as soon as I realized that my, um, that my calling was really art, not Amway, and that he wasn't going to do it, even though we had a profitable, profitable business in Amway, I said, it's your business, you do it. And of course, that the business fell apart, but I went to my art and used all the skills I learned. So I had a, a university degree on marketing that was free while I worked my ass off at Amway. <laughs> so there you go. So that's how I learned. It's reading books. Uh, I just got a, a class to teach art, a, a drawing class. I haven't done any drawing since I was in 20 years old, 25 years old, other than just my sketches from my paintings. And uh, I have gone back and read four books cover to cover in the past month just to be able to do a better job teaching that that drawing class so so we all have the ability to get to it the library uh, and other other ways these books these are books i had from 40 years ago believe it or not you know when i back when i was in college and i read them again and brought up things and and was enthusiastic about it any other questions yes from from nadine is asking um do the sites mark up your work or how do they mark up your work? Oh, okay, so you, this is the best thing about, okay, a publisher will come to you and say, we want to publish your work. We're going to put it here. We're going to put it there. And I say, well, how much do you sell the work for? Because I don't want to compete with my work that I'm selling. I don't want to compete with my work at an art show or in a gallery. I said, it's got to sell for the same price. And they aren't going to sell for the same price. They're going to sell it for less and depreciate your work. And then they're going to, and then they'll say, well, you're going to get 5% or 10%. You'll end up making $5 a print on a painting that's maybe 30 by 40. You'll make $5 a print, but they say, we're going to sell hundreds of them. Well, if you sell on Fine Art America, you can price your work to price exactly where your work is already priced. So no, my, none of my prices are, are, are less than my prices that I sell already myself. And there's an algorithm you can figure out pretty easily with them that if you put down the price that you want, $1,500 for the painting, you'll know exactly what they're taking out of it. You might get $1,200 or, or $1,100 for the painting. They're selling it for $1,500. You're getting your markup that you want, which is much higher than $5. So I get $1,000, $2,000. That shark painting I sold, they printed, I don't know, maybe cost them $300 and I got $3,000. So the, I don't know if other sites do that. I'm so happy with Fine Art America. I've tried some others and they didn't work for me. So I do try and I have my assistant look at different things and go over them and we'll enter things and we'll get out of them. It doesn't work for reasons that I don't find reputable. I've had a lot of unreputable things happen to me. So Fine Art America, you can actually work out your algorithm to be just exactly your own prices. You're, you make the same profit you'd make if I sold it at the art show. And now I, the other thing nice about Fine Art America, you can give people coupons, discount coupons. So if I meet somebody at the art show, I said, you go on Fine Art America and you email me and I'll give you a 20% coupon or a 30% coupon. So I'll give them a discount to get them on Fine Art America. And that's all easy. It's not hard. And if it's hard for you, go on Craigslist, hire somebody, go through three or four or five, six people, put down what you need. You'll find lots of people that'll do it um, away from you at home, which you will eventually end up having a lot of them do, but they have to work in my studio with me first. So I make sure that they know what they're doing and they're representing me the right way. That's great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, it's been a pleasure. Now, if we have time, we can go back and show the video. You wanna do it? Nancy, do we have time? Sure. Yeah, let's go back and show the video because I didn't want to show that until I knew I had a chance to answer questions. So I'm going to go back to share my screen, go back to my presentation, and I'm going to share that. Let me come back to the top. And here's my video. Hey, I'm Lori Hine. Actually, I use the name Lori Snow. Hine. Snow's my maiden name because I was already painting with. Trying to do it big. Just a minute. Hey, I'm Lori Hine. Actually, I use the name Lori Snow Hines. Snow is my maiden name because yeah, I was already painting way before I got married. I live in West Palm Beach, Florida, Washington Palm Beach Gardens. I was born in New Jersey, 
my parents owned a home the year after I was born and we would come back and forth. We were the original snowbirds because my last name was snow and we went south every single winter. Who would think you could make a living painting? I was particularly good at portraits and I started training for portraits when I was 12 years old. So that's one of the things that I really love doing. But I started really uh, as an artist taking a living when my husband lost his job. I have a girlfriend in Atlanta who's an incredible pastel artist and she called me and said, I need help doing a portrait of my two girls. I helped her finish the painting. I went down to the frame, ready to get framed. And when it was getting framed, a publishing company walked in, saw the painting, and said, who did that? So we got my first job with a publisher who published my artwork. And then I started really working for my publisher, whatever they wanted to paint. I paid it for places like current greeting cards and um, home interiors decor. And if they said, we want this, then I would paint that. And I got better and better because I had to do so much. You know, it's like, it's just that 10,000 hours plus of painting that makes you get better and better. But as I matured and, and did more artwork, I started, I got all these prints from the publisher and them. So that's how I started the art fair. And I thought, well, how did I get rid of them? So I went down and visited Artie Graw for the first time. I went down, I think it was one of the very first Artie Graws. It was here in West Palm Beach and, and walked around and, and found many artists who were going to talk to me and ask them how they did it and what tent they bought. So that's been 30 years that I'm still doing art shows. So as a teacher, it's different than me as a painter. And as a teacher, I have this enormous feeling that I want to give as much as I can information to my student. My favorite painting is probably the one I'm going to do next. <laughs> you know, to be truthful, there's always a story behind every painting. If it's not a story, then a feeling or an emotion or some kind of special thing about that painting or that location that I want to remember and share with other people. I wasn't really thinking about painting a seagull, but I loved the way that the uh, wind was blowing his feathers and how that would create a feeling of movement in my painting. I like painting big. The reason I like to paint big is because it feels like you're there again. I did some uh, botanical paintings for a while, and they were some of my favorite paintings, just the capturing of the light on the, on the plants and the colors of the plants. And what really made it in favor for me was the movement of the paint on the canvas was more of a flow. It wasn't like it, it wasn't labor to make a shape or a form exact, but the paint could flow one color color into another and that made it so much fun for me. My passion is really Florida. Florida where I've explored every corner I can get into and I will keep exploring till probably I die. I love kayaking. I, I love getting out of the rivers. I love biking. I have my RV and I travel. So I'm always looking for the little uh, gems that I think are Florida that people may not get always to see at that time of the day and those locations and, and help people remember how beautiful our state is. That was great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's see. I got to find you back again. I've lost you. <laughs> see. How do I get out of here? Do we have other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Any other questions? I've well, we want to thank you, Laurie, very much. I'm, I will uh, close this out, Nancy. Okay, on behalf of the Florida Artist Group, thank you for joining us for the art of being an artist. We hope you've enjoyed this live presentation. A link to the video recording of this presentation will be sent to you in the next few days. At the end of the session, a short survey will be sent to you, and I hope you will reply. Uh, some, Actually, I, I think that the next uh, presentation is closed, isn't it? So I won't announce that we have room because we don't. But thank you so much, and thank you for your Hope that you can make our next one at two o'clock today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, bye -bye. everyone. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. She's something, isn't she?